Welcome everyone who's joining us online. Uh, we're here at Trinity Pacific Church in a new sermon series called Let My People Go. And I'm inviting you to open your hearts and begin by singing with me, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word. Um, Chris, please lead us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are almighty, that your word is true, and that when you say you will do something, it's as good as done, no matter if there are hundreds of years between your word and the action. We thank you for bringing us here together because we know that you love us. And you want to speak to each one of us. You have a word for us. You know the situation that we're in. You know the needs that we have. And you want us to come to you. And so this is what we do right now. We ask that you remove everything that is of a disturbance and that you allow us to focus only on what you are speaking to each one of us through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' precious name. Oh, man. It's uh, wonderful to be here together with you, and I trust that um, you've entered into a season of Lent in a meaningful way. Um, Lent began last Wednesday, and for those of you who are going through our devotional booklet, you may have been surprised that uh, there was no devotion for this morning. Uh, 
The answer to that is that Lent is a day of 40 days of fasting and Sundays are feast days. And for that reason, the uh, devotional focuses on the fasting and it allows us to feast as we wish. Uh, we will be feasting together after our service. We'll be putting up uh, tables and chairs and there will be a meal. There will be a feast, a light meal. Let's put it this way. Let's uh, wait for the big feast uh, in glory, right? Um, but yes, uh, this is a, a really meaningful time of the year where we prepare our hearts for the amazing event of Easter, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, for this season, I felt led to take us through the Exodus story. We're going to go and walk with Moses and Aaron and the people confronting Pharaoh until he finally lets them go. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at all the plagues. We're going to take a look at the context. But we also want to enter into that. And so on Maundy Thursday, I want to invite you to a Seder meal. Not a Jewish Seder meal. No, this is a Jesus Seder meal. <laughs> and uh, that is the meal that the Israelites shared, putting the blood of that lamb on the doorposts so that the destroyer angel would pass over. And then we will actually take a look at that 10th plague at the killing of the firstborn and do that on Good Friday because there's a connection there. Good Friday, blood and salvation belong together and this is God's plan of salvation and then of course the exodus would not be complete without walking through the Red Sea on dry ground and that takes us to Easter Sunday there's something amazing happening in that story of the Israelites going through that um, Red Sea on dry ground and then seeing their enemies taken care of by the Lord. Um, and this is a place that I would like to journey with you this season of Lent. So for the following Sundays, we'll be in the book of Exodus, but not only, as you've already heard from our um, New Testament reading today. Let's begin with an encounter. And the first encounter that we have is the Lord encountering Moses. Um, we need to recognize that God is the beginning of everything. Without God, we wouldn't have creation. Without God, we would not have the world that we live in, the seen and the unseen world, the stars and everything else, because God spoke it into being, right? We know that. Everybody knows that. But God is very keenly interested in people. People are created in his image. And so he wants to have a relationship, a personal relationship with each one of us that we are actually unaware of until he encounters us. And the beautiful thing is that he did this to Moses, as we know, at the burning bush, and probably even before then, but he doesn't tell us all the stories that happened in his life. Um, and now Moses is in Egypt. Some stuff has happened and some bad stuff has happened. And the Lord encounters Moses again to kick off this new, um, yeah, power encounter with, with Pharaoh. And in Exodus 6, 28 and 29, we read the following. Now when the Lord spoke to Moses in Egypt, he said to him, I 
am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I tell you. Now, the first time the Lord encounters Moses at the burning bush, do you remember his first words? His first words were, Moses, Moses. Remember? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> What's going on here, right? And then he has to take off his shoes because he's standing on holy ground and all the rest, right? But that's been established already. The Lord knows when he speaks, Moses will recognize his voice. Moses knows who the Lord is. That's, that's been a very intense journey up to this point. And so the Lord doesn't need to call him by name. This time he says, I am the Lord. Now, the first time he introduces his name as Lord, which as we know is the Tetragrammaton, Yahweh, is in response to Moses' question about what God's name is. And here's what we read in Exodus 3, and this goes back to the burning bush. Here's what the Lord says. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. However, it's not until Moses gets back to Egypt that we read in Exodus 6, God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. Again, those words that we're going to focus on today just a little bit. I am the Lord, he says to him when he gets to Egypt. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as El Shaddai. I appeared to them as God Almighty. But my, by in my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. Now, something that I've come to uh, appreciate is that in the original text, in the original Hebrew, there's, there's a certain power in the way it's written. There's only two words that we translate for I am the Lord, and that two-word construct is I, Yahweh. Ani Adonai, right? And the verb is missing because that's a, a normal thing in Hebrew. We don't um, deal with uh, little petty things, but in English, we need to translate that as I am the Lord. And this particular construct, Ani Adonai, or I am the Lord, comes 201 times in the Old Testament. That's a lot. Yahweh itself, the name of the Lord, actually appears 6,828 times. But there's something special about this construct where the Lord says, I am the Lord. And I'm going to give you just a few examples from the book of Isaiah. If you have been following in our daily bread, the Old Testament readings for each day, you'll be in the book of Leviticus now, that's where I'm in. And you may have noticed that this construct, I am the Lord, comes again and again and again and again. It actually comes 22 times in the book of Leviticus. But we're just going to jump over that and go to Isaiah and just allow these words into our hearts. Isaiah 42, 8 says, I am the Lord that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. Isaiah 45, 5 and 6. I am the Lord and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, People may know that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. 
Isaiah 48, 17 says, this is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. This is really intense. This is the word of God. <laughs> this is literally what he says to us, and we need to really allow that to sink in. This is who the Lord our God is. And then the Lord goes on to say to Moses in Exodus 6, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I tell you. And of course, that's what God is saying. Then I think we don't have any doubt about what he means, right? But let's remember that we here now in the 21st century read the Bible in hindsight. Moses is experiencing it and does not know what is coming yet. <laughs> this is important. Moses told the Israelites not that long ago what the Lord had told him. He had done that. What happened? They did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. Now the Lord comes again and tells Moses to speak to Pharaoh. And the last time Moses and Aaron had gone to Pharaoh, the Israelites were commanded to go and gather their own straw, but make the same number of bricks as before. That turned out really bad. And all we did was say what the Lord wanted us to say. Of course, the Israelites blamed Moses for that. So Moses, when the Lord says, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I tell you, Moses responds by saying, uh, since I speak with faltering lips, why would Pharaoh listen to me? Of course, I'm exaggerating, but I believe Moses exaggerated at that point too. As a matter of fact, it's not the first time Moses brought that argument to the Lord. We remember at the burning bush in Exodus 4, Moses said to the Lord, P -p -p pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. And then even later when he gets to Egypt, <laughs> again, he's having this conversation with the Lord. In 6 verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, if the Israelites will not listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me since I speak with faltering lips? Clearly, Moses thinks that this argument is going to convince God. Um, you tell me what to say, but the way I say it doesn't come over well. <laughs> it just doesn't, doesn't do the job. You got the wrong guy. Get somebody who's a smooth talker, right? Not, not me. But Exodus 7, verse 1 to 5 goes on. This is how the Lord responds to Moses' faltering lips. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you. He says it again, right? And your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart and Though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt with mighty acts of judgment. I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. Notice that when the Lord speaks, there is no if. <laughs> if doesn't exist for God. It does not exist for God. 
When he says, this is what will happen, it actually happens. And the other thing that I want us to really embrace is that most of the things that the Lord says to Moses here, he had already said to Moses at the burning bush. This is not new stuff. Exodus 7, 1, I have made you like God to Pharaoh and your brother Aaron will be your prophet, reflects Exodus 4, 16, Aaron will speak to the people for you and it will be as if your mouth, as if he were your mouth and as if I were God to him. Exodus 7, 2 is where we are now. You are to say everything and command you. Exodus 4, 12 says, I will help you speak and teach you what to say. Here in Exodus 7, 2, your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. In Exodus 3.18, go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. Here in Exodus 7.3, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you back in Exodus 3 at the burning bush, but I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. Exodus 7, 4, then I will lay my hand on Egypt and with mighty acts of judgment, I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites. Back at the burning bush in Exodus 3, I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. And the last phrase that the Lord speaks to Moses in 7 verse 5, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I strike, stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of Egypt is actually a response to what Pharaoh had said to Moses the first time they met. In Exodus 5, 2, Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. And the Lord says, The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand. And bring the people out. In other words, God has not changed his mind. The plan is the same plan. The plan was given to Moses at the burning bush, and it hasn't changed. The same plan. The Lord meant every word the first time he spoke it. And he'll say it again if need be. And friends, yeah, I've heard the Lord speak and kind of disregarded it. And then when the Lord speaks again, oh, oh, I think I remember those exact same words. Forty years later, in Numbers 23, 19, the prophet Balaam says the following, God is not human that he should lie. Not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? That's who God is, and Balaam knows that. Hundreds of years after that, later in 1 Samuel 15, verse 29, the prophet Samuel says, The Lord, who is the glory of Israel, does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a human being, that he should change his mind. And remember, even hundreds of years before Moses, in Genesis 15, the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there, but I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. God told Abram his plan <laughs> more than 400 years before his plan actually started, and now he's 
telling Moses exactly the same plan. It's, it's, it's not a different plan, it's the same plan. God is God. What he says he will do, even if it's hundreds of years later, you can trust the Lord. You can trust what he says. Now, the beautiful thing is that after that encounter, that little struggle there, that faltering lips kind of thing, uh, Moses realized, okay, I get you. I remember everything that you told me at the burning bush, and it's nothing's changed. Uh, okay. And so we come to obedience. As a matter of fact, the beautiful thing is that Moses grows up at the court in Egypt. Moses actually grows up bilingual. He grows up Hebrew with his family, and he grows up Egyptian at the Egyptian court. And he knows how to read and write, and he's got papyrus and all kinds of stuff, right? So Moses takes the time to write down the things that God has said. After he hears from the Lord, he doesn't want to forget those things. He writes them down so that he'll have that in his journal for later. And praise God that he did that because now we have those words from God. And so he remembers his journal. He remembers those words because he's written them down and Moses begins to understand that if does not exist for God. Once Moses came to terms with who the Lord was, there was only one logical conclusion. Just do what he says. Don't fight it. Just do what he says. In Exodus 7 verse 6, we read, Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. Praise God. The question for us is, am I doing what the Lord says? Then the Lord reveals his game plan for the next move. You see, very often the Lord gives us the big picture, and we don't get too many details. I've been there, <laughs> kind of fighting with the Lord. Nah, that's not enough. I need some more details. Give me, the, give, give me all the all the nitty gritty, the when, the how, and all that kind of stuff. No, 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 he'll give it to us when we need it. And so now that you're ready to obey, now I'll give you the next step. And here's what the Lord reveals. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh and it will become a snake. Remember, they haven't yet gone to Pharaoh, but the Lord already knows what Pharaoh is going to say. We, we have to really let that sink in. The Lord already knows what Pharaoh is going to say, even before Moses and Aaron get there. And the Lord also tells Moses what to do and Aaron what to say and do. And the beautiful thing is, Jesus does the same. Let's go to the New Testament. So we we're in the Old Testament, and now we're going to the Injil. In Matthew 17, 27, Jesus says something very direct to Peter. He says, go to the lake, throw out your fishing line, Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Um, is there any doubt in Jesus' mind when he says that? <laughs> There's like, it's not like, if you do it this way, and, and maybe you've got to do a twister here and make sure you, this, this is the kind of, you know. No, no, no. Do it, and this is what will happen. Then give it to them for my tax and yours. In Luke 19, verses 30 and 31, Jesus tells two of his disciples, go into the village ahead of you. So they're not there yet. As you enter the village, you will find a colt tied there. Oh, 
Jesus already knows there's going to be a gold tied in the middle, which no one has ever ridden. He even knows that. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. He even knows the question that will be asked, and he gives the answer, and exactly that is what happens. In Luke 22, 8 to 13, we read, Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Well, that's a big statement. And they asked Jesus, where do you want us to prepare for it? Okay, that's a good question. Okay, Jesus, that could be anywhere, right? And Jesus replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Oh, follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished, make preparations there. And then the Bible goes on to say, they left and found things just as Jesus told them. So they prepared the Passover. When we have come to know the Lord, we know that what he says is true. And when he tells us to go somewhere, to do something or to say something, it's best if we simply Coming back to our story, we read again in Exodus 7, verses 10a. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Okay? So they know the big picture, and now they have this very precise assignment. He's going to ask you for a miracle, and this is what you're going to do. Now let's see what happens. The reason I entitled this The Lord Encounters Pharaoh is because sometimes we think it's Moses against Pharaoh, but it's not Moses against Pharaoh, right? In Exodus 7, verse 10, we read, Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his servants, his slaves, his officials, and it became a snake. So it's exactly what... The Lord had told Moses would happen. When Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, it will become a snake. But that is not where the story ends. Pharaoh then summoned wise men and sorcerers. Okay, notice that first when they come in, there's slaves there, there's officials, you know, there's, they're fanning him, you know, just the regular kind of Pharaoh stuff, right? And now, Pharaoh says, oh, you've got a trick up your sleeve. I'm going to see if we have one too. And now he brings in the wise men and the sorcerers and the magicians. And the Egyptian magicians did the same things by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff and it became a snake. Hmm. There was a long tradition of wise men and magicians at the court of Pharaoh. 400 years earlier, another Pharaoh needed some help. In Genesis 41, we read, so he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them for him. And I trust you'll remember that Joseph was called in from prison. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it, but I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And here's all the wise men and magicians and sorcerers standing around Pharaoh and this one Hebrew is now told to do what none of them could do. Joseph replied to Pharaoh, I cannot do it. Oh, <laughs> Why did we even bother bringing him up from prison? But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Oh, let's see where that goes, and you'll remember where that went. In our story here, 
Pharaoh calls in the wise men and magicians, magicians, and they did the same things by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff and it became a snake. These magicians had supernatural power, but it was dark power. You need to remember, these secret arts depended on the power they received from Satan. In Luke 4, 5 to 7, we read, The devil led Jesus up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me. And I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. And guess what happened? These magicians, these sorcerers, these wise men worshipped Satan. That's where they got that power from. Now, that was not the end of the story. Moses and Aaron are here. Pharaoh's here. Magicians, wise men over here. Their rods are turned into snakes. There's all these snakes crawling around in Pharaoh's palace. And then we read in Exodus 7, 12b, but Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Can you see that? All these snakes crawling around, and then Aaron says, okay. All done. The Lord is not worried about Satan's power. Jesus is never nervous. <laughs> His power is greater. When Aaron throws down his staff again, God's snake swallows up all the devil's snakes. This power encounter was not Moses against Pharaoh, it was the Lord against Satan. In the New Testament we read in Ephesians 6, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And that was the same encounter that happened right there. This was not Moses speaking to Pharaoh, it was the Lord speaking through Moses. This was not Pharaoh and his magicians doing the same thing Aaron had done, no. It was the devil and his demons doing a counterfeit miracle that looked exactly like what God had done through Aaron's rod. Just because it looked the same didn't mean that it was the same. And the proof of that was that Aaron's snake swallowed up the devil's snakes. Friends, Satan has great power and he uses his power to deceive. In Matthew 24, 24, Jesus says, false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Let's not be deceived. <laughs> Only God has unlimited power. And only he has given all authority to Jesus Christ, his son, as we read in Matthew 28, verse 18. His snake will ultimately devour all the devil's snakes. And in 2 Timothy 3, 8, we read something very surprising. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these teachers oppose the truth. Um, we know about Moses, but nowhere in the Bible except here, and this passage is written about 2,000 years later, almost 2,000 years later, do we read about Janus and Jambra. So, what's going on? They are mentioned in several sources that date back much further than the Apostle Paul. 
The Jewish Virtual Library tells us, and I'm quoting, the sources of the legends surrounding the activities of Janus and Jambres go back at least to the time of the Second Temple. Okay, when was the Second Temple? The Second Temple was after the exile. And so that's a long time. That's like more than, that's 400 years before Jesus because we have that silence of 400 years. They are mentioned in the Damascus document in the Tzadokite fragments as Janus and his brother. The names also appear in pagan Greek and Roman literature. These same two names don't just appear in Jewish sources, they also appear in pagan literature. In other words, there's probably something there. <laughs> Both Pliny and Apuleius mention the names of Janus only, the former including him in a list of Jewish sorcerers, the first of whom is Moses, while the latter names him immediately after Moses in a list of famous magicians. Both Janus and Jambres, however, are mentioned and discussed in detail by Numenius, the Neo-Pythagorean philosopher. According, the, the, the Jewish encyclopedia states something very interesting. According to Midrash Yilamadenu, Midrash Yilamadenu, Janus and Jambres were among the mixed multitude that went up with Israel from Egypt. We read that in Exodus 12, verse 38. Ah, so we got these two guys who are on the bad side, and they decide to go up with the people of Israel. And then they aided in making the golden calf. Oh. They went underground, <laughs> they pretended, they pretended to be converted, right? They pretended that they left the bad side and went to the good side as soon as Moses is gone, 40 days. Guess who shows up again? Who they really are. No wonder the Apostle Paul uses them as a negative example in his letter to Timothy. And I'm gonna read the passage that goes before and just after their, the mention of their names. There will be terrible times in the last days. So obviously, the Apostle Paul has seen or has been revealed some kind of truth about the last days. This is prophecy about today. People will be lovers of themselves. Is that true? Lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these teachers opposed the truth. They are men of depraved minds who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected. But they will not get very far because, as in the case of those men, their folly will become clear to everyone. Janus and Jambres remind us that secret arts, sorcery, and demonic deception are just as powerful now as they were when Moses confronted Pharaoh. They even have a form of godliness. They even pretend to be Christian, if I can translate the word in our terms. 
but deny its power. What does the Bible say? Have nothing to do with such people. Allow me a few words of conclusion. In order for us to be on the Lord's side, like Moses and Aaron, we need to obey what Jesus tells us to do. And of course, we can't know what he is saying unless we recognize his voice. Moses recognized the Lord when he spoke. And Jesus says in John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them all so they too will listen to my voice. Only those who have surrendered their lives to Jesus can hear his voice. They will follow Jesus wherever he leads. They will do what Jesus tells them to do, and they will speak the words Jesus tells them to speak. This is what Moses and Aaron did. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. And when we do that as well, we can be assured that the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. We can be assured that the Lord snake will always gobble up the enemy snake. When we belong to Jesus, we can confidently say, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Friends, if you are willing to surrender your life to Jesus and live in the victory that Moses and Aaron experienced. And we're going to talk more about that these next couple of Sundays, as you can imagine. I invite you to read this story of the Exodus in, in your Bibles. If this is what you desire, then please pray with me. Father God, we don't understand what happens in the unseen realm. We don't understand how you can say something and it happens. We can't understand how you can just say, let there be light when everything was darkness and all of a sudden there is light. We can't understand how you can tell Abraham something that will be happening more than 400 years later. But your word is true and we thank you for your word because as we get to understand a little bit more of your word, we get to understand who you are. You are not a God of if, but you are a gracious and merciful God. You reach down into our very personal lives and you've sent your son, Jesus Christ, to live as one of us in flesh and blood, being tempted in all things, even as we are, yet dying on the cross for the sins of this world as a sacrifice, the only sacrifice that could be used to forgive us our sins. And so, Father God, we come right now to your holy throne of grace and ask your forgiveness where we have not trusted you. Where we have come up with excuses like Moses, faltering lips, or no time, or whatever it was. Because we knew what you actually did want us to do, but we didn't want to do it. Father, forgive us. Forgive us. This is sin. And we ask that you would pour out the blood of Jesus over us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Father, having recognized, having heard from you today, this morning, that when Moses and Aaron choose to obey, that you show your power in amazing ways. You show your power 
by speaking directly to them the next step of their journey with you. And we need to hear from you so that we know where the next step in our journey with Jesus will be. And so we come and we surrender our lives to Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you for your patience. Thank you for knocking at the door of my heart. I don't want you standing outside. I want you inside. And so right now, by faith, I'm opening the door of my heart. You promised that if I do this, you will come in. Please come in, Jesus. Please take over. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my moments and my days. Let them be in ceaseless praise. Lord Jesus, thank you that as you move in, as I step aside, that you make me a new person. I'm not a renovation, I'm a new creation. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, the spirit of love, the power, spirit of power, the spirit of sound mind, so that I will go where you want me to go, do what you want me to do, and say what you want me to say, always and only in your perfect timing, Lord, not in my timing, always and only in the power of the Holy Spirit, always and only to your honor and glory, my Father in heaven, and to the honor and glory of your Son, my precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.